Shield Wall Hastings 1066 by White Dog Games. So this is a boxed game and it also comes with mounted counters. So definitely an upgrade from uh, the DTP and print and play publications of White Dog Games in the past. As for the topic, well, the title is pretty self explanatory. We are going to have a game about the Battle of Hastings. Um, the player plays the role of the Saxon defending Sella Hill and that a player will lead the coalition of forces trying to take control of Sella Hill and also to take control of the road that leads to London and that departs from the hill. Uh, let me show you how the game works and then we can talk a little bit about gameplay. The rulebook is only four pages, so pretty much a single sheet of paper folded in two, yay! Yet the uh, publisher recommended that I printed the uh, living rules available on the publisher website because of clarifications and errata that are present in the living rules, and I did that, and then I placed the four pages of the rulebook on that magnetic board there. Uh, that really makes them easily available for a reference during gameplay. Here we have the board, it is made of two separate sections that you need to place adjacent to one another. It represents a Sandlock Hill and the surrounding area. Important features of the terrain are hill hexes represented by these whitish hexes, steep slopes, a regular slope, and then of course clear terrain. Woods and swamp hexes are impassable. You also have streams which of course will give a movement penalty to units that move across them. Here you have the Saxons that are ready to defend. At the beginning of the game, the Saxon player sets up his unit north of this line here. And of course, that player will want to take advantage of the hill. And then the invader will set up his unit south of or on this line here. And the invading player represents a coalition of Norman, Britain and French forces, but for simplicity in this game, this side is simply called the Norman side. Units in this game are divided in leaders, knights, foot infantry and archers. All units have a movement value printed at the bottom right corner. Most units also have a melee factor, they're printed in red on their counter. All the archers do not have that. And leaders also have a command value printed in a black box, more or less in the middle of their counter. Some Saxon units start the game uh, showing a shield, like in that case. Those are pretty much two-step units that can be in two states, uh, with the shield up or without shields. When a unit of that type takes a hit, it is replaced by a pretty much identical counter. The only difference is that it doesn't show a shield. If that unit takes another hit, then it is removed from the game. Otherwise, all other units are one-step units. It only takes a hit to eliminate them. Leaders, however, when hit, can roll a die, and if you roll equal to or less than their command value, the leader is safe. You can ignore the hit. Each turn starts with the Norman Rally phase, during which the Norman player rolls a die for each leader on the board, and for each roll that is equal to or less than the command value of the leader you're rolling for, you can return a unit that was eliminated uh, the previous turn to the board, and that unit should be placed as close as possible to the leader that rallied that unit. Units that are not rallied at the end of the rally phase are moved to the dead pile and those units are out of the game. After this, the Norman player can move, units move up to their movement allowance, and that will be modified by terrain, and after movement, of course, there will be combat. But an interesting thing about movement is that is that um, that units project a pretty 
a rigid zone of control meaning that when you move into the zone of control of an opponent you have to end the movement and you're pretty much locked there you cannot leave the only units that can disengage from an enemy zone of control are Norman mounted units and leaders can do that automatically regular knights need to roll to determine whether or not they're actually able to leave an enemy zone of control once uh, all Norman movement has been completed, you have normal combat, which is divided in two parts. One is arrow fire. Archers can fire. For each such unit, you roll a die. If you roll a six, then you inflict a hit on the opponent. If you roll one or two, that means that the archer run out of a of, uh, of arrows and you simply remove the archer unit from the board. After arrow fire resolve melee combat which is mandatory between all units that are adjacent to an enemy unit and for each such unit you determine the attacker and the target, you roll a die, you apply modifiers for example to attack from a hill into a slope is a plus one. If a knight moves adjacent to an enemy but also moved through at least one clear hex terrain uh, before reaching the opponent, that knight is considered to be charging. And there's a plus one bonus for units that are charging. You also add the melee factor of the units. If the total modified result is six or more, you inflict a hit on the opponent and you reduce a two stamp unit or you eliminate a one stamp unit unit. If an enemy unit is eliminated you must move into the hex that was left vacant by that unit with one exception. If um, you are attacking from a hill into a non-hill hex then you're allowed to stay where you are to retain the position and not to um, move out of the hill. If a two-step Saxon unit or a Saxon leader is eliminated, that can cause great psychological distress to the Saxon units that are adjacent to the space that was just left vacant by the, uh, by the destroyed unit. All such units, with the exception of leaders, must pass a route check. You roll a die for each such unit and you need to roll equal to or less than the command value of a leader that is within three uh, hexes from the unit that is taking a check. If there are no such leaders within that range, you get a plus one penalty. If you roll equal to or less than the command value of the leader for that unit, you pass the check. If you roll more than that, the unit is removed from the board. Then you have the Saxon player turn that is very similar to the normal one with some exceptions. The Saxon player also starts by trying to rally units that were eliminated in the previous turn. Then the Saxon player may receive reinforcements in turns from three to six inclusive. Saxon player rolls on a table and that table may give him reinforcements or not, you do not know. Then the Saxon player can move and after that you have the Saxon melee combat. The Saxon player does not have archers so he can only attack by using melee. But there's an interesting thing here. After the Saxon melee combat, you may have the Norman core route. Uh, Norman units do not route individually, they route by core. For each core that lost at least a unit and that still has units on a slope, you need to take a check. And it's a pretty drastic thing. It's either or and it's 50% chances. If you roll one, two, three on a d6, nothing happens. Your units uh, hold their position. If you roll four to six for that core, all units belonging to that core move back. They basically move up to their full movement allowance and they need to move into at least one hex that is not in an enemy zone of control and not in a slope. So they are basically trying to, uh, to reach clear terrain. For each unit that is routed in that way, you place a route marker in the area that was just vacated by that unit. Suppose that here both, both uh, cores route and this would be 
pretty much the situation. And after this, it may be that the hot-headed Saxon units will simply try to uh, to follow the opponents. They may launch themselves into involuntary pursuit. When the uh, Norman units route, you roll a die. If you roll five or six, then you have a special phase called Saxon reactive movement, and that starts with the involuntary pursuit. That is all units of the Saxon player that are adjacent to a route marker must move up to their movement allowance uh, to try and attack an enemy unit. Good thing is that they get a plus one bonus when they're attacking that way because they are gain, getting berserk. That's the advantage of being crazy. On the other hand, they are leaving a good position, a good defensive area, and the uh, Norman player may try to exploit that. You resolve melee combat and may result from the Saxon involuntary pursuit, and that ends the Saxon player turn. It also ends the turn you move the turn marker to the next turn and, well, you start the procedure again. You can win the game immediately, even before uh, the end of the last turn, by eliminating the enemy leader, uh, William and Harold, respectively. You can also win the game immediately if you eliminate all the units belonging to the opponent. Not an easy thing to accomplish. Otherwise, the game lasts until the end of turn 8, when you assess victory in the following way. If there are no Norman units on the hill axis of Sunlock Hill, the Saxon player is the winner. If there are no Saxon units projecting a zone of control on the axis of the road to London, then the Norman player is the winner. A draw is possible in case there are Norman units on Sunlock Hill, but there also are uh, Saxon units that are still protecting the road to London. The game manages to put together a very simple gameplay system with um with interesting details about the historical conditions of the battles, the archers that run out of of arrows, uh, the terrain that is problematic for the Normans, uh, the routes of the Normans, that just many interesting things that are pretty well factored into the system. The game moves fast, the combat resolution is very fast, lucky enough you don't have to uh, consult any table, you just roll the die, apply the modifiers and you have the result right there, which is important because each turn, especially in the early turns, you will roll a lot and Without that, those turns would just be too long, they would drag too much. Um, gameplay doesn't seem to offer a huge depth of, uh, of options and possibilities. As the Norman player, you need to take control of the hill. There's just nothing else that you can do, or that you should do. So you're just going to attack and attack and attack. If you are routed, then you'll just attack back. You may see that in some cases an opportunity for your knights to move back enough to gain room uh, enough to then be able to charge, but still the idea is that you're going to charge. Um, you can try to maneuver, you can try to do things, but the space of the board is not such that you have a million possibilities. And as a Saxon player, you're trying to uh, retain control of the hill. If the, um, the Norman player starts opening gaps in your lines, you'll move units from the rear to, uh, to fill them. If the Norman player is threatening your leader, you'll move units to defend against that. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, moments of vitality when uh, your units do not behave the way you expected them to, uh, which is pretty much when the Normans route and then also when the uh, Saxons uh, launch themselves in involuntary movement and berserk combat, then they may inflict a lot of damage on the opponent, but they may be in such a position that will allow the opponent to move around them and gain ground on the hill. So, uh, I think that it, overall it works well. Again, uh, gameplay in terms of decisions seem a little, seems a little limited, but there are the things that will spice things up and will give you more things to deal with. Uh, one thing that is uh, problematic, and I think this will be a problem for many players, is that the victory conditions as they are written right now make it absolutely impossible for the Norman player to win the game. It is that simple. I'm not even going to say it is very hard. I think it is absolutely impossible. 
because the Norman player needs to uh, to remove the Saxon units from the zones of control of the road to London in order to win. And this is terrible because, uh, well, the Norman player does not have enough time to do that, to inflict enough damage and to move and to push the Saxon units away uh, enough to to do that, to really have so much impact on the Saxon formation. Um, the Saxon has the advantage of terrain, has the advantage of reinforcements, two-step units. Uh, there are just many things that the Saxon player can count on and the Saxon player most likely will either win or if the Norman player plays very well and is very lucky, well, the game will land in a draw. I think you will need to tweak the victory conditions to make the game um, just challenging for the Norman player because as of now it is something different from challenging, it is just suicidal. So, uh, in conclusion, this is a game that really has pluses and minuses. Uh, it is a game that it is not too, um, I think, challenging in terms of strategy. That also means that it doesn't have huge depth, but it has an entertaining course, uh, overall narrative course of action, thanks to the unpredictable events. Uh, the uh, victory conditions are just something that you have to work with, so I just see pluses and minuses in many aspects of this game. This doesn't make it a bad game, but it doesn't make it a great one either.